Uh, I hope to go actually rather quickly through one main point I have to make today, and that is why it's so hard to reactivate uh, HIV from latent cells. Uh, and then I'll maybe mention a few uh, uh, specific uh, approaches that might go into the clinic uh, that people may not have thought about. Um, so, <coughs> I'll basically just talk about this particular point, the shock part. Uh, we don't do any kill, and uh, the only thing we might be able to bring to the gene therapy is to increase the expression of these proteins in lymphocytes uh, because we believe that they contribute greatly to the lack of maternal fetal transmission uh, by blocking uh, HIV replication. And they're actually partly inducible in T-cells already and they decrease uh, HIV replication uh, by an interesting mechanism which involves translation and that they also actually block endogenous retroviruses and they also block endogenous uh, mobile genetic elements in different settings. So, so HIV obviously infects activated cells. And this is a beautiful illustration from Janet Ivasa, which was presented at Croy, I guess, uh, of how the virus actually goes from the cell membrane into the nucleus, where it integrates. Uh, and the virus actually integrates mostly into active genes, in other words, into areas which are relatively uh, open chromatin, and so this is reverse transcription. Here the DNA is pushed into the cell and then integrates into the host genome. So the first question is how does the virus not just basically go full blast and uh, kill the cells and replicate at full speed? Uh, so we actually think that uh, so the 90 percent of the viruses that enter the cell are replicating and they kill the cells or they make new viral particles because the cells have plenty of this molecule called PTAB and they have plenty of this molecule called CDK11. So I just shall tell you, these are two cyclin dependent kinases. NF-kappa B and TAT require PTAB uh, for splicing, 3' end formation and for export you required CDK11 cyclin L. This is recruited by these two activators, as I said before. This is recruited by something called the trax thok complex. And so when the levels of these proteins are very high, this cyclin-dependent kinases, then the virus can replicate and you make new viral copies and everything works. And so this is basically an activated cells. And uh, <coughs> basically this allows for a rapid uh, spread of the virus in the infected cells. Now the reason that some of the cells do not express the virus in this context is primarily due to transcriptional interference or mutation of the viral uh, sequences. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, we know that because we have partially poisoned the exosome, the RNA exosome that degrades introns, that degrades partially transcribed RNA sequences. And when you do that, you see an incredible amount of read through transcription early in infection and in almost all transformed cell lines, like jerked cell line, uh, HL60, and so forth. So the normal situation is that the virus integrates and starts transcribing here and ends here. But if you have a strong host cell promoter in the sense orientation, then the polymerase from the host cell promoter goes to here, stops here, and the 3' LTR now begins to fire as a initiation of transcription. In the anti-sense orientation, there is no polyinhalation signal, and so the polymerase just keeps going say, straight through. You can also see this phenotype by depleting CDK11, which is required for 3' end formation, so you actually see much more of this in that context. Now, <laughs> the best example of this phenomenon is by using the dual fluorescent viruses, uh, either Sadovsky's or uh, Eric Verdens where you can see either red cells, green cells, yellow cells, or cells that have no uh, fluorescence. So if they are red cells, that means they have transcribed from the 5' LTR. If they are yellow cells, they have transcribed from the 5' LTR, but somehow terminated here so that both promoters are on, so that both red and green are made. 
And if they are transcriptionally interfered by retro transcription of the 5' LTR, they're only green. And if they're in the opposite orientation, they're only, they express no fluorophore. So basically, and if you do this experiment, about 10% of, uh, of all the viruses that go into, for example, jerkit cells, are transcriptionally interfered and do not express a full viral proteins. That is also true for SIV in, uh, in cells, but I don't want to go through this. If you take a primer of the read through transcription, you can see all kinds of strange transcripts occurring uh, from host promoters or polymerase that's transcribing from upstream of the gene. So this is a big problem, uh, both in terms of why the virus can establish latency, because already inactivated cells is not expressing its genome, and because those cells will go resting and therefore the virus will now be silenced by different mechanisms, for example, the lack of transcription factors or the lack of uh, this CDK, uh, CDD kinases, beta B and uh, uh, cyclin, CDK11 uh, cyclin L. So, uh, it turns out that resting cells have almost no, for example, beta B, and almost no cyclin L, CDK11. So basically, you have to increase the levels of this CDK, CD, CD kinases to be able to get any transcription from the HIV LTR. So this, is, this occurs because the T loops of these CTD kinases are dephosphorylated in resting cells. Uh, allosteric changes lead to 7SK SNRP dissociation, so there's also no 7SK SNRP, which Susanna uh, introduced to you. There's a loosening of cyclin CDKD binding and then degradation by the proteasome. So basically, all of the machinery for HIV transcription is missing in primary resting cells. Uh, I don't want to go through this because it's already covered, but basically, this finding was confirmed in 1994 when we looked at HIV-infected individuals after seroconversion. And we saw in the periphery nothing but short transcripts, which do not require either Peter B or uh, cyclin LCDK11. But when you activate the cells, we were able to fully restore HIV replication and HIV transcription with long transcripts, and the virus was coming right out. And now there's a new finding from the laboratory of Joe Wong, which also looked at primary cells uh, from HIV-infected individuals, but now on chronic antiretroviral therapy with complete suppression of viral uh, RNA. And so he used different primers. This is a much more sophisticated approach through a RTQ-PCR approach to look at what transcripts are present in these cells from optimally treated HIV-infected individuals. And he was able to, they were able to confirm basically our finding from 1994 that primarily you see the short transcripts, the TAR transcripts. There's some read-through transcription, so that's nice. So that implies that that's still remaining. There is some full-length uh, viral RNA being made, but there's almost no spliced RNA. So splicing is severely attenuated. Uh, elongation is severely attenuated. Uh, and there's still some read-through transcription. So this probably represents the whole spectrum of resting, truly resting cells, which have no uh, transcription factors that allow for HIV transcription, and some mild activation, which allows for some suboptimal expression of viral genes, but not probably enough to be able to be detected by the immune system. So, how, what, how can we approach this problem of the fact that both Peter B and cyclin L, CDK11, are missing in resting cells. So one way to do it is by adding uh, PKC agonists like PHA, PMA, or activating T cell receptor. So there's no, these are two different individuals, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, actually CD4 cells, and there's basically no Peter B, and there's basically no CDK11. And then if you, <laughs> add proteasomal inhibitors like MG132 or bortemozid or Velcade, which I don't have on this slide, you can now rescue the expression of both uh, Peta B and cyclin LCDK11 in both cases. And pretty equivalently to what you can get through optimal T-cell activation. So, 
what is going on here? This is very reminiscent of the cell cycle CDKs, for example, cyclin E, which is required for the S phase of the cell cycle. What happens here if the cyclin E is not bound by CDK, it gets immediately degraded. If cyclin E is bound by a chaperone, then it can interact with CDK2 to make a functional cell cycle cyclin, and this allows the cells to proceed through the cell cycle. But the moment the cell cycle is over, you phosphorylate the pest sequence in cyclin E, and therefore it's completely degraded right away. And in part, that's due to the fact that if the T loop is not phosphorylated in this kinase, then the allosteric change in the cyclin CDK is such that basically it unfolds and it's degraded by the proteasomal system. So something happens in resting T cells as they progress from activation to rest that degrades the entire machinery here, Peter B. And this occurs through sequential dephosphorylation of the T loop, loosening of the binding between CDK9 and cyclin T, and then some phosphorylation of the pest sequence in cyclin T, and then finally total proteasomal degradation of the complex. And so that is one of the reasons why it is so very difficult to reactivate HIV, because you have to first establish the machinery of transcription to be able to affect viral reactivation. So, just to summarize this part, so basically in resting cells, you have no p b you have no 7SK, uh, you have no cyclin T1, a, cy a, a cyclin L, CDK11, and therefore basically the only thing you make is some polymerase sitting here and some initiation of transcription and not much elongation or not much uh, uh, viral replication. So, the strategies so far have been to use a PKC agonist and a latency reversal agent as a combination therapy for HIV. And the reason they are synergistic is because the most latency reversing agents like histone deacetylase inhibitors or bad bromodomain inhibitors cannot increase the levels of PTAB. So, they cannot work on resting cells without PKC agonists because they are the only ones that can lead to the phosphorylation of the T-loops, the stabilization of the kinase complexes and activation of this kinase that required for HIV transcription. So basically, you require something to activate PTB, something to activate cyclin LCDK11, and then the latency reversing agents can start working and allow for the completion of viral transcription. Now, the way actually the latency reversing agents work is by converting this inactive complex of PTB to an active complex. In other words, they release PTB from here to here and not through modification of chromatin or the modification of epigenetic landscape uh, where HIV is found. So, just to summarize all of this, is that to optimally activate the virus, you would have to first stabilize these complexes, these transcription complexes, with some protosomal inhibitors. Then you would phosphorylate the T loop of these kinases to be able to make them active. Then you would release this complex, at least the PTB from the 7SK inactive complex. And then finally, you would be able to activate HIV transcription. So it would be a three step process. Uh, and this would only probably work on viruses that are not transcriptionally interfered. So the free PTB then increases the synthesis of hexim, which inhibits or resembles the 7SK SNRMP, but because TAT steals PTB from 7SK SNRMP, HIV transcription continues, that of other germs, uh, genes is actually turned off. So this is actually a sort of an Achilles heel of the virus, that the RNA binding domains of TAT and hexim are basically identical. And so TAT actually goes here, and kicks hexim off the 7SK, therefore releasing PTB and allowing for uh, transcription, for HIV transcription. Uh, and that is why, in our current strategy, we are including proteasomal inhibitor, especially Velcade or, or, uh, or uh, Bortezomib, which has been used for uh, treatment of multiple myeloma 
because that is very synergistic with all the other approaches to reactivate HIV, because it now allows for higher levels of transcription factors that are required for HIV uh, transcription. So, all of them, all of them are, uh, all of them are um, synergistic with uh, Velcate, for example, for Stratton, Brastad, Ingenol, Kansui, uh, HMBA, or Saha, and uh, bed bromodomain inhibitors. And we will be very curious to know if people have patients, HIV patients with multiple myeloma, who've been getting Velcade or, uh, uh, or Bortemozid for their uh, multiple myeloma, because they might, in fact, have lower viral reservoirs. Uh, so, we, I could stop right now, but I can tell you that we have some very useful assay to assay all of these transcription factors for drug development, for anti-HIV or HIV cure approaches. So we have an assay for the release of P2B from the 7SK, which we call the visualization of P2B activation in cell. It's a really beautiful assay. You can see it here. Uh, you administer JQ1 to cells. And then within 60 minutes or less, you see that all the P2B has been released from 7SK. SNRNA is then available for treatment. So you can actually test all the drugs, for example, all the HDAC inhibitors, all the uh, bed bromodomain inhibitors, uh, azacitidine, for example, they all work by this mechanism. So you can actually do a high throughput screening of new compounds that will release P2B from the inactive form. Now we have an assay, which is, this is not the best one, but we have a very good assay for the reassembly of the inactive complex. In other words, P2B going back with Hexim to the inactive complex, to the 7SK SNRP which is also very useful, not just for HIV, because, as I told you, TAT can work with both substrate, but also for cancer therapy, because Hexim turns out to be most potent cell growth inhibiting and anti-proliferative and differentiation agent known to man. So Hexim basically will stop any cell from growing uh, if it's in the 7SK complex. Then we have an assay for read-through transcription, which basically is a dual fluorescent assay for, for ignoring the poly-A site and going through for, a, for levels of CDK11, uh, which can also be uh, used for high throughput screening. Finally, we are still working on measurement of, of viral reservoir and residual replication. So it turns out that HIV-infected uh, cells make a lot of viral particles, but in addition to viral particles, they make exosomes. And basically, there are two types of exosomes. There are exosomes that contain NEF, and there are some exosomes that contain TAR. Uh, now, the exosomes that contain TAN and NEF are much easier to observe and to count. Uh, for example, you can easily see here in the Western blot, plenty of NEF in the circulation in these exosomes. And this is a picture from Kashanchi's paper suggesting that there are plenty of TAR exosomes, even in optimally treated uh, long-term non-progressors. Now, we have been having more trouble with the TAR exosomes, but with the NEF exosome, we've been able to do this on about, now about almost 200 people. Uh, we can uh, look at the uh, RNA, uh, NEF, and, uh, and uh, uh, NEF content in these exosomes. And one thing that's quite interesting, at least to me, is that if you treat people with non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase, you have many fewer NEF exosomes than if you treat them with 3TC or, uh, uh, or uh, the other types of uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which may indicate that maybe you can penetrate much deeper into tissues with non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors than you can with uh, 3TC or other such compounds. But the NEF exosomes appear to be extremely useful in terms of not only looking at perhaps residual replication or some HIV expression somewhere, but because you can look at their structure and their protein composition, you might be able to determine where they're coming from, let's say brain or liver or other organs. So uh, it might be a very useful surrogate uh, biomarker for HIV uh, infection and during treatment in terms of success of treatment. Uh, of treatment modalities. So, 
I would like to suggest that in terms of HIV latency, it is very important to appreciate what is going on with the basal transcriptional machinery in the cells before you try to reactivate the virus and to use the best possible combination of things sequentially to be able to get the virus transcribed. Uh, I think it's very important to be able to monitor the effect, effects of uh, different compounds and discover new compounds, perhaps by the methods I have described, this rapid colorimetric assays. Uh, and we would be very happy if we were able to discover more biomarkers to follow this reservoir. For example, under the ideal situation, you would have NEF exosomes for continuing residual replication, and you have TAR exosomes for true latent cells, which do not express anything but TAR. And as we showed before in 1987 and 1994, which is a long time ago, there are plenty of the short transcripts in HIV-infected cells, even in resting state. There's no problem in seeing them because, for some reason, they also are secreted or go away from the DNA and float into the cytoplasm even, and you can actually easily uh, follow them. And they get secreted these exosomes, uh, and they might be a true measure of the reservoir in terms of latency, of truly latent cells in the body. So, the final thing is that we've talked about last time about Kansui, and I won't talk any more about this. It's a beautiful plant, has roots which uh, have this compound called Kansui or Avalos in Brazil. They have 12 different ingenols, six different UFOLs, four different Kansuinins, and they've been taken in China and maybe in Brazil for millions or thousands of years actually described even by Herodotus and the Greek, uh, uh, Greek literature uh, of their healing powers for things like ascites and uh, fluid retention. Um, and actually, the Kansui root, which costs $15 per kilogram primarily because of shipping, uh, is the, one of the most potent activators of HIV that we have actually studied. And I talked about it the last time. But apparently, it has gone now into monkeys. So and apparently it's gone into humans. So apparently uh, there are human trials at uh, Utah, at Salt Lake City, uh, small little trials to see if they will do anything to reactivate uh, HIV in that setting. So thank you very much for your attention and the people who did the work are listed here uh, in my laboratory. Matthias, are the cells that are producing the NEF exosomes also making intact virus particles, or are they making only NEF exosomes, or, or only TAR uh, exosomes? Probably hard to figure that out. I would That's guess. very hard to figure out, yeah, because it's in the periphery. We, we separate, we took about two years to be able to, pers uh, to separate the viral particles from uh, exosomes. It's not so trivial. Uh, but we do know that NEF infected cells like jerkets will make both. But the question is, you're asking whether. Uh, so, so, so cells will make the exosomes uh, with, with NEF uh, in the absence of uh, gag or envelope to, yes, to, to trigger yes. the. Production yes, there's of no the gag there. In fact, if you look at the early infection when only NEF and TATA REV are made, uh, basically you get NEF exosomes without any viral, viral particles. Very provocative talk. Um, with regards to the uh, decreased levels of uh, PTFB right. and, and CDK11, um, so CD4 cells undergo homeostasis and exposure to gamma C chain cytokines constantly in the lymphoid tissues. Do you know whether those cytokines can enhance the levels uh, in no. those cells? No, sorry. We are looking for, I mean, if you were to know, I mean, several Nobel Prizes were given for the way cell cycle CDKs work. And if you can figure out how this works, I mean, how the transcriptional cell cycle CDKs work, I think if I were to start a lab today, it would be a very interesting uh, thing to do. But uh, we don't know what the CAC is. We don't know what the CDK activating kinase is. Uh. Hi. Yeah, uh, so I was curious about the CDK11. So uh, n uh, mice knock down for CDK11, are, they die in embryo. Yeah. And cells, when you knock down uh, CDK11, it's, it's very... Uh, they die, yeah. They die. Yes. So I was curious to see that in resting CD cells, there's very little. Do you know if it's very little or nothing is expressed? Or there is, and if nothing is expressed, do you think there's still homeostatic proliferation in those circumstances? Or 
I'm, I was just surprised by the low levels of CD11. Well, we haven't been able to knock it out with CRISPR, so we have basically decreased it a little bit with, uh, you know, shRNA. Uh, and what you do actually, actually um, was published before in ES cells, that basically now you get nothing but read through transcription. You wouldn't believe it, but you get uh, transcripts that are megabases long. I mean, they just go through genes upon genes upon genes. I mean, it's just... Uh, the cells... Uh, just don't divide. I mean, they're basically uh, they're basically totally resting, as far as I can see. I mean, they are having I don't know what is what they require to vegetate, but uh, clearly, without PTB and without CDK11, none of the acute response genes can be turned on. None of the uh, activated genes can be turned on. So it's it's very inert, very very. They don't. They cannot proliferate without those. No. But in vivo, they would proliferate, right? By homeostatic proliferation, right? And in vivo, do you think you would still see oh, those I see, I low see. levels of CDK11? You mean IL15, IL15 or whatever, or IL7? That about 10, 15 percent of T cells homeostatically proliferate. They have to raise their level of PTB somehow. And CDK11 as well. Yes, CDK11 as well. Yes. Or there is any other uh, homolog of CDK? Uh, there is something that would replace CDK11 in those circumstances, or no? Well, CDK12, 13 can do part of it, but with a different. Uh, they get. A, we've also published on that, and CDK12 is actually interesting because it is the third most commonly mutated gene in breast cancer. It controls the transcription of BRCA1, BRCA2, APR. ATR, uh, Fanconi, and all this uh, DNA repair genes. So it's brought to the three prime ends through the exon junction complex, which means long genes with many, many uh, introns and exons can recruit CDK12, which does the same thing. And they all do CDD phosphorylation, so they phosphorylate the serine 2 in the CTD, which is then required to bind the cleavage and polydilation factors and some splicing factors. So that's how they work. They actually phosphorylate the tail of the polymerase, and actually it's the tail of the polymerase that also dictates all the epigen epigenetic changes that you mentioned. For example, all the acetylation is done by the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase. All of the uh, chromatin loosening is done by the polymerase. It's not done before the polymerase. So it's actually done by the phosphorylation of the CTD, which is occurring through CDK11 on HIV and CDK12 uh, on, uh, let's say, BRCA1, BRCA2. Mattia, the, these NEF-containing exosomes, mm -hmm. um, they can be derived from cells with productive, with real virus, right. as well as cells that have yeah. truncated viruses or defective Presumably viruses. Presumably, yes. Right. yes. As long and, as they make NEF. You can just right. make NEF in cells and you make exosomes. Right. So do you think that they're, they're coming from cells in the blood or from cells in the tissue, or both? Well... Okay, so the dogma is that activated cells don't circulate. T cells, as long as the lymphoid system is intact, it's only resting cells that circulate. That's why we found nothing but short transcript. That's why Joe Wong found nothing but these little, this little crappy things. No, tr no splicing, no real polydenylation. Uh, so if the lymphoid tissues is intact, then I think they will be mostly coming from the tissues because there's not enough activation, not enough transcription to make NEF in the periphery. Uh, and that's why we're sort of excited because we've actually been able to get some brain-specific markers on these exosomes. But it's, it's very tedious. I mean, you have to... Uh, but it would be nice to be able to just get an antibody like CD32 or something if that worked. And, put, and if that was on the exosomes, then you could uh, so you, pull them out with the antibody. Right. You should be able to pull them out with an antibody onto beads the way right. Lonya right. does, or right. you, you might even be able to flow them if your instrument is I sufficiently agree. I agree. It would be worthwhile to go. I mean, but, you know, there's financial issue there. <laughs> or people issue, yeah.